All right, before I get into the sermon, uh, a few things I want to cover. First off, uh, September 11th, there's going to be a sort of a back-to-school barbecue that Drew and Tyler sort of been spearheading, and they've been getting the, the meat ready and whatnot. And so September 11th, that is a Sunday, and it'll be at 6 p.m. And now that is the second Sunday of the month, so there won't be any potluck that day. So come, uh, we're going to need people to bring sides and whatnot, so there's going to be barbecued meat, and it's going to be a back-to-school barbecue. So Anybody is welcome. So if you know somebody in the community that you want to invite, invite them. Uh, there's going to be a lot of meat, but the, the slogan is we're feeding till the food is gone. So uh, invite people, but don't guarantee that there will be something because it might be gone quickly. That being said, uh, oh wait, another thing that I do want to cover. Um, so, well, there's a few things. I'm remembering them now. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first thing is that I just wanted to say this because I, I want you to know that you, you can come to me. So if uh, there's ever a time where, where I'm preaching and you hear the sermon, you're like, well, I don't know about that, Aaron. Come talk to me, okay? Uh, if there's anything that you're a little confused on or if there's anything that maybe I said that you're like, hey, I don't know about that. I don't know if that is what the text says. Come talk to me. I, this morning, just this morning in class, the I was reading and I read part of Daniel and, you know, I think Eddie was like, well, that's not what my, my, my text says. And so again, you know, I have an issue of translations, different translations, and, you know, that kind of thing. If, if there's anything you are confused on or if you have an issue with, come talk to me, okay? Don't, don't ruminate on it. Don't, you know, continue with the grudge thinking that, oh, this preacher's just false teaching, whatever. Come talk to me. Seriously, come talk to me. It's okay if you, if you think something was off or you're, you're left a little confused, so... Uh, that being said, uh, I want to get into the sermon, but I'm going to do something a little bit different, okay? Uh, under the seats in front of you, there should be some uh, paper. Should be. Uh, I don't have enough for everybody, but you can at least share with some. In front of you, there should be some paper with a letter on it. Ready? I'll wait till everybody gets something to look at. So, it says, To the Apostle Paul, We fail to see how your imprisonment is beneficial, whether for us or for the gospel. Moreover, we are scared for ourselves. The, the same government that has bestowed on us rights, rights that we did not have before, has now taken you, our leader, captive. They'll come to know our connection with Christ and you. Surely we are next. There have already been issues with some of the community trying to drive Christians out of Philippi. All this being said, we still have a few faithful preachers who have seemed to become more bold in light of your imprisonment. We are concerned, however, about a few who are indeed bold but preach for the wrong reasons. What shall we do about these preachers with false motives? Admittedly, our faith has been shaken for a number of reasons. Our hearts break because of what has happened to you. We wish Christ could come down and smite those who hold you captive so that you wouldn't have to worry about any of it. More than this, we wish Christ would free you so we could see you once more. Our faith is weak, our fear is great, our suffering increases daily, and some of us are unsure of the salvation that has been promised. We pray that Christ would set you free and end the suffering that befalls many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, the church at Philippi. Now, obviously this is conjecture, right? Oh, we cannot know exactly what the Philippians may have said to Paul, but this does kind of illustrate a point. You see, the letters that Paul writes, the letters that make up most of the New Testament, they're not just written out of thin air, right? It's a two-way street. Usually, these congregations would write a letter to Paul about their concerns. Now, obviously, we don't really have those letters, but this is a two-way street. Paul writes these letters for a reason, and one thing that should be understood about these letters, these letters, they're not written to us, but they are written for us. Meaning there, there's stuff in, in Paul's letters that we can take that are written for us that we can learn from, but quite literally these letters are written to a, a people in a specific context. Now I tried to highlight this uh, a few weeks ago. Remember, I said that Philippi is a Roman colony, right? This part of the context that Paul is addressing. See, they had rights that Roman citizens had, and Paul, one of the first things he emphasizes in Philippians is servanthood. And I think this is in, in 
a direct response to what they're going through. They're valuing their citizenship a little too highly, so Paul wants them to understand, remember, that the thing that is of most importance is their servanthood, not the fact that they're being served by the state. Right? And so with this in mind, and as we're going to read Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 30, as we read through this, I want you to consider the context. Philippians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Well, what happened? You see, Paul's imprisonment happened, right? Remember how I mentioned this. Paul was imprisoned, and you can see this in Acts, at the end of Acts, in Acts 21 and following. You see the process of Paul being in prison. Now, just as a quick summary, Paul, he essentially, he wanted to go to Jerusalem, right? And he literally, he received a prophecy that he would be imprisoned if he goes. But Paul, he goes anyway. He's arrested by the same people that had a hand in Jesus' death. Then Paul, he goes before a Roman council. He goes before a Jewish council. Then the Jews, they want to kill Paul. And then the Romans, they put Paul in custody, protective custody. And then Paul, he goes before a Roman governor, Felix, you know, trying to decide what we should do with this Paul. And then Paul finally appeals to Caesar, and Paul ends up and Rome, and that is where he is while he writes the letters uh, to, the, to the churches, some of the churches, and the letter to the Philippians. And so Paul, he says all of this, everything that happened to him being in prison, all of this is to advance the gospel. See, Paul, he is bold. He sure is bold. But there's more to it than that. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Now, context. So, Ananias has been told to go to Paul, then Saul, right? Because Christ has some plans for Paul. So, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, that is Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen, he being Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and who? And kings. And the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. See, this whole, whole thing with Paul, Paul being in prison, Paul going to Rome, Christ knew this was going to happen. This was part of Christ's plan, and Paul knows that everything, his imprisonment was for the sake of Christ. Verse 13 kind of shows us the result of this advance of the gospel. So verse 13 in Philippians chapter 1. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the, all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Notice something interesting about this verse. The advance of the gospel does not just mean converts. The advance of the gospel does not just mean people come to, to be a Christian. See, Paul understands that his sacrifice, his imprisonment, everything he has gone through will all have been worth it if people just hear, if people just know what, who Christ is, and if people just know what Christ has done for me, it will have been worth it. You see, there are going to be people who hear, who hear about Christ, who hear about what he has done, but they will not come around. That's true, and that's, that's on them. But for you just to make people aware, aware of what Christ has done, aware of what Christ has done for you, that is good in itself. That is an advance of the gospel. Verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now here's another result of the advance of the gospel. People have become more bold. People have become more bold because of Paul's boldness. You see, boldness can be infectious. Key words, can be, right? It can be infectious. For instance, uh, uh, the, the weekend before, as I mentioned, Michaela and I, we went to a wedding, right? And so at the wedding, it was, it was for a couple that we knew from camp. They had a DJ for the reception, and so the DJ, you know, he played, he played songs for two-stepping and some other line dances I have no idea how to do. But he ended up playing the Cupid Shuffle. Who knows the Cupid Shuffle? Oh, no, this is not good, only one person. Anyway, so, you know, it's like to the right, to the right, to the left, to the left, now kick, now kick, that kind of thing. I'm not going to do it for you, but uh, he was playing the, <laughs> he was playing the Cupid Shuffle, and so, 
you know, I was thinking, oh, I know this. My, uh, in fact, this was something we did in elementary school for gym. My mom was my gym teacher, so she kind of taught me a little bit of that. So, you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, I kind of know the movements to this. So I, I get out there with some other people to do the Cupid Shuffle. And to say the least, I thought I knew how to do it. It was kind of, it was just an attempt to say the least. Meanwhile, Michaela's standing by, right? She's standing to the side recording me and laughing. So, you know. Uh, my, my point being, boldness can be infectious. Other times your wife will just stand by and laugh at you. Uh, so, as we see in the text, Paul, he has this boldness to preach the gospel, and his boldness to preach the gospel rubs off on other people. They become bold to speak the word without fear. Now, I want to look at verse 15. It says this about these people who are bold. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. So there are people who become more bold, but not everybody has the right motive. Paul acknowledges there are some people who preach for the wrong reasons. They treat preaching like a means to their own end. And I'm sure we can all think of examples of this, and usually our mind first goes to televangelists, right? And usually for good reason. I recently read that there was this one televangelist who who was trying to convince his congregation that he needed a fourth private jet for his ministry. You know, th things like that kind of make you question whether or not they're, they're preaching for the right reasons. And so I'm still waiting on my first private jet. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's totally a joke. <laughs> That's totally a joke. So uh, some people preach, however, from goodwill. Now, this word, this phrase, goodwill, is actually an interesting one. It's used in a few different contexts. It can mean favor. It can mean good intention. It can mean good pleasure. Now, I like the translation as good pleasure. Essentially, Paul is saying that there are some who don't have hidden motives. Some preach Christ because they see that preaching Christ is good in itself. They just take good pleasure. They have good intention in their preaching. They don't need an extra reason to preach the gospel. Moving on to verse 16. The latter, that's the people preaching out of goodwill, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So there are some who are bold. Uh, the ones who preach from goodwill, they're doing it out of love. The ones preaching with false motives, they're not doing it out of love. They're doing it out of selfishness, right? And I think of Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25. Let us stir one another up to love and good works. So in Paul's case, his boldness, his love is rubbing off on other people who are being bold and they are loving. It's a good thing to serve with one another, to stir one another up to love and good work. Speaking of which, look, we, we got some service projects going on in the church. We got the soup kitchen. We got some other things in process. So come to these things. Really come, serve, join us together because it helps us. It really does. When you serve with people, when you love other people in a group, it makes it so much easier. It gives you encouragement to do that more, to love people more. Verse 17. The former, that is the people preaching with false motives, the former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now here's something specific Paul is dealing with, right? He still deals with people he's addressed in 2 Corinthians, right? I remember 2 Corinthians, I mentioned this a few probably several weeks ago now. So in 2 Corinthians, Paul, he addresses people that have challenged, that have challenged his authority. Right? They challenge the authority that Paul has been given by Christ. And yet again, Paul, he has to address this in Philippians. Now for context, 2 Corinthians was written around 55 AD and Philippians is written in 62 AD. So seven years later, Paul has to address the same issues that afflict the church. I can't imagine the church has reoccurring issues, right? And of course, we all know it does. Verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Whether in pretense, with a front, with a false motive, Christ is proclaimed? Wait, well, Paul, what about these people with the false motives? What about these people preaching for the wrong reason? Shouldn't, we, shouldn't they just be stopped? Why do you rejoice in that? Do you rejoice in their false motives? Now notice something. Paul does not rejoice because they are preaching. He rejoices because Christ is preached. See, that's something you should hold as a standard anytime you come to church. 
Anytime you hear anybody speak, you should not be coming, oh, I'm so glad to hear Aaron, I'm so glad to hear Craig, I'm so glad to hear Francis Chan. No, 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 no. You should be more concerned about who is preached and not who is preaching. And so in this case, Paul, he, he understands there are people preaching with false motives, but sometimes people with false motives still preach the truth. And so, if, yes, they may have false motives and they should be called out for that, but if the truth, if Christ is at least being preached, we can rejoice in that. Verse 19. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Paul rejoices over his predicament, but why? He says it there, because of their prayers, because of the Spirit and because of the deliverance that Jesus will provide. Don't underestimate those three things, prayers, the Spirit, and deliverance. Don't underestimate those three things. Prayer can help us so much. Spirit especially can help us so much. We've underestimated the Spirit as we talked about this morning in class. So many people have underestimated the power of the Spirit. Moving on in verse 20. Verse 20 highlights something very interesting about this deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by what? Whether by life or by death. See, Paul understands that he's going to be delivered by Christ whether he lives or whether he dies. Whether you live or die, do you believe that you will be delivered? We've been going over Daniel in our class this morning, and uh, several weeks ago we covered Daniel chapter 3, and part of Daniel chapter 3, that Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, that's their real name, you know them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, they tell King Nebuchadnezzar, look, yeah, you may throw us into the, into the furnace, but guess what? No matter if we're thrown into the furnace, no matter if we're delivered, or no matter if we die, we will serve God. See, they trusted God that much. They trusted God regardless of the outcome of whether they lived or died. See, that kind of faith, that kind of trust, let's be honest, that is hard. That is hard. We want blessings. Oh, we want to be blessed physically. We want to have a long, healthy life. But the reality is that might not always happen. So do we have enough trust? Do we have enough faith to realize that God can deliver us, whether in life or in death? It's not easy but we ought to have that kind of faith and trust. Verse 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Now this verse, for me, it's always been confusing to me. I'm like, what do you mean, Paul? What does that mean, for me to live is Christ? Well, I think it kind of has to do with, see, in life or in death, he is with Christ. In life, he is with Christ in the sense that Christ permeates his life. Christ influences and changes every aspect of his life, and in death... He will be in the presence of Christ before God's throne. Both of these things are very good things. To have Christ influence your life, to fill your life, and to be in the presence of Christ before God's throne. Both of those things are good things, but Paul is obviously conflicted, as I think we would be. Right? So verses 22 through 26 say this. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And so as we see in these verses, verses Paul kind of reasons with himself as he's writing. What, what, what should I choose? And are we at all surprised by Paul's decision? I don't think so. Paul, he's, he's been so selfless. He's let Christ just, just live in him and through him constantly. And so he decides to do the selfless thing. Paul is willing to suffer more on earth for their sake, to go home with Christ, to have more, no more suffering, to have no more pain. That is far better. But Paul, for the sake of the Philippians, desires to remain. Verses 27 through 30. 
Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And not frightened in anything by your opponents, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here I still have. Now I debated on whether or not of addressing this, but I'm going to, because sometimes preachers make last-minute decisions. Uh, so in verse 27... Notice where it says, so whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit. Now, now the, that for reference to the spirit is not to the Holy Spirit. It's actually kind of interesting. So it's pneumatos. And sometimes this word, it has to do with kind of outward actions. You, you can hear it in the scripture, whether it be talking about, you know, they have a gentle spirit, they have a uh, caring spirit, that kind of thing. So this kind of spirit deals with outward actions. So being unified in how we act and then it says, with one mind, suke. That's where we get our word psyche from. So it's our inner being. So being unified by how we act and how we are in our inner being. Hence why he says, only let your manner of life be worthy. Your manner of life and how you act and how you are. And that being said, or another question I want to ask you, what are these opponents? Paul says that they should not be frightened in anything by your opponents. Who are these opponents? Well, you see in uh, Acts chapter 16, this might be it. In Acts chapter 16, Paul is in Philippi. This is when in one of his missionary journeys, and he comes across him and Silas. They come across this slave girl who has this spirit of divination. And essentially, she just, she just kept following Paul and Silas around, yelling at them that they're men of God. And evidently, they get a little annoyed. So Paul, he casts out the spirit of divination from her, and she had uh, owners who were using her. For their profit. And so they didn't like this, so they had Paul and Silas thrown in prison. So maybe these are the opponents. Maybe they still have issues with these people who don't like Christians because they uh, ended their way of making money, right? Regardless of the opponents and who they are, one thing is for sure. There are people in Philippi who do not want the Christians around. Interestingly enough, Paul says that there's something that they can have that will be a clear sign of their destruction. So Philippians 1, 27 and 28. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that of God. Now, some people will focus on the fear. Oh, it's the lack of fear that is a sign, of their, sign to them of their destruction. But I think it has to do with this one spirit. Being unified in this one spirit and how we act. Being unified in how we are in our inner being, being changed by Christ from the inside out. And also it has to do with the fear. Not being afraid of your opponents. Understanding that you have an assurance in salvation, as he says in verse 28. We have the salvation. We don't need to be afraid. Matthew 10, verse 28, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Be afraid of the person who can kill both body and soul. You see, people on earth, they can harm you physically. They can't touch your soul. God has your soul in his hands. God is in control of that. Now, before wrapping up, I want you to pay close attention to verse 29. Verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. See, being a Christian is not a free pass on suffering. We have a lot of guarantees as Christians. Right? God promises to change us. God promises to cleanse us. God promises to save us. Right? We have those guarantees in Christ, but another guarantee we have is that we will suffer. A guarantee not many people like. And we're going to suffer whether with 
social consequences or physical consequences, we are all going to suffer for the sake of Christ, just as Paul did, just as so many of the the apostles, really all of them did. One way or another, we will suffer for the sake of Christ. So as we go through life, we got to bear with one another in suffering. we got to be bold, because when at least one of us, at least one of us is bold, then other people will be willing to be bold, to preach the word, to, to love others, regardless of our circumstances. we got to be bold. we got to love. And understanding that once our suffering on earth is done, we will have this salvation that is promised to us in Christ. So if you have any need, if you have not received this salvation, if you do not have this assurance, this, this one of the reasons you can be bold, then you can receive that now. If you have any need, if you need prayers, you can come now as we stand and sing.